Luke chapter 24. Let's read the Easter story. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and when they had entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day he raised again. And he did just that. And the crowd that follows, just continue on as Luke writes, he talks about how Jesus appeared to two men who were walking along the road and, and how he began talking with them and sharing with them and they didn't even recognize who he was because the people didn't expect Jesus to be risen. Even though he had told them, even though he laid it out, they had a hard time understanding the resurrection. Even though they had seen their friend Lazarus come back to life, they didn't understand what Jesus was saying. The women went back to the room where the followers were at and said to the men, this is what happened. The angel said this. And we see them doubting. They had a hard time believing it. Jesus shared with these two men on this road, they were going to Emmaus, and Roger taught our life groups about this this past week and just laid it out so well and how they just, they just couldn't get it. And finally, their eyes were open. They understood Jesus was there with them. He was alive. Jesus then appeared back in Jerusalem among those followers, and he was talking with them, sharing with them. They're going, we see you, but it's hard to believe. And he says, look at my hands. This is me. It's really me. And trying to convince them, and and they thought he was a ghost at first. And finally, he says, do you have anything to eat? Jesus saying this. He goes, I'm kind of hungry. Doesn't sound like a ghost, does it? And he was a very real bodily resurrection. He was there in front of them. And he began to speak with them and share with them. And so when we gather on Easter, we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, there's people that have a hard time with that. Because in our mind, it's hard to believe that someone can come back from the dead. And did this really happen? And we want you to know that there is evidence for it. Sure, it's a decision of faith, but there's evidence. And I love the story of so many people have tried to get in there and just really wrestle through the facts. Did this happen or not? Not just surface level, but really get in there. And one of those men we know about is, is Lee Strobel. And he came and spoke here at Harvester a few years back. Lee Strobel was the legal editor for the Chicago Tribune. And his wife was a believer. He was an atheist, he said, and he just thought, this is crazy. I'm going to scientifically lay it out, legally prove, just put the facts on pace, that this did not happen so he could prove to his wife and get it done once and for all. But guess what? In the process of studying all the facts, he becomes a believer. He was overwhelmed with the evidence to support the resurrection of Jesus. It's there. And if you're a person today, it's going, I, I'd like to believe, but I just don't know. How does this work? I encourage you to get his book that he wrote. Just a very simple laid out, his story, and all the facts laid out, and you can know assuredly. Again, there's a step of faith, but your faith can be real. It can be solid. And if you're here today, I believe God has brought you for a reason. So we're glad you're here. And, and I want to say uh, greetings to the people that are in the chapel, the overflow. We're glad you're here also. You're in a special place, the chapel. But God has you here for a reason. He has you here so you can hear and be reminded of the truth of the resurrection of Jesus and what difference that makes in your life. It's interesting because we may wonder about how life could come back, but think how life comes about in the first place. How God gives life seemingly out of nothing. You know, how do you take this little acorn that means nothing and this giant oak tree comes out of that? How God can take the seed of man, the sperm seed, and the egg, egg seed of a female and put them together and life comes and forms and everything that you need to sustain and grow and mature in life, God brings out of the small, minute particles of life. And God breathes life. God's the giver of life. And God is also the one who can and will restore life. And he did that with Jesus. So we're looking through Luke. What does it mean to be redeemed? And sometimes we come to Easter, much of the world celebrates the Easter bunny of all things, and they, they eat chocolate, and they're excited about their baskets, and you know, that's all Easter, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more. Now, my, my favorite Easter candy is Peeps. I think that, that's the best. And if you go down to the children's check-in, there is a giant Peeps, like this big. It just, it's just amazing. Those are fun. 
But better than all that is the truth of what this day of Resurrection Sunday is all about. It's about Jesus. Last week, Nicoma shared with us about redeemed. He gave us a definition. It means to buy back by paying a price. A price is then that, per, that is redeemed back to us. Ben on Friday night spoke and he shared about, I don't know why he used cabbage. He says, if you go to the grocery store and buy all the cabbage that's there, in a sense, you're redeeming that cabbage and bringing it back out of the store. I don't know why he picked cabbage, but he did. But the sense of something was bought with a price and paid back. I love the old story of the little boy who made a boat. And he made this little boat out of wood and took it down to the lake and and it made a little sail on it, watched it float around, and I once made a little boat and put it on the pond, and it just sunk. It didn't go anywhere. But this little boy's boat, the wind caught it, and it blew it around, and he watched his little boat all of a sudden sail off in the distance. He tried to chase along the shore, but he lost, along the shore, but he lost his boat. And he was sad, but his boat floated, and we went home, and days later, he was walking along the little shops downtown, and he seen a little boat in the window. It looked like his, and he got real close, and it was his boat. And he went to the shopkeeper and says, that's my boat. And he says, not anymore, it's mine, I found it. And the little boy says, it's mine, I want it back. He says, if you want it, you have to pay for it. So the little boy goes home, empties out his piggy bank, and sure enough, he's got barely enough money. He goes back and he buys his boat from the man, and he says to the little boat, and he gets, he says, you're twice mine. I made you, and now I've bought you back. And that's what Jesus does for us. He made you. He created you, he gives you life, and he bought you back with his death on the cross and his resurrection. The old hymn writer, Fanny Crosby says, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer, the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a transport receives. That God redeems you when he died for you on the cross. Hebrews chapter two, verse 14. There's a verse that says this, since the children have flesh and blood, and that means people, you and I in this room, we have flesh and blood, so too, he too shared in their humanity. Jesus became human so that by his death, Jesus' death, he might destroy him who holds power over death, that is the devil. We see in Jesus' resurrection, he conquers the enemy. So Jesus became human, God became flesh, live amongst us, and then he conquered the evil one with his death on the cross and his resurrection. So when Jesus was on that cross, he became our guilt offering before God with our sins, and it says it is conquered. Whatever the enemy holds over you, whatever is in your life, the sin that weighs you down, the thing that separates you from God, Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he conquered that snare, that what's holding you back in your life. He's conquered what's been passed down through those family, those traits. You say, this is just who I am. No, Jesus conquered the evil one. He's changed us in your life. You can live for him and you can understand what hope and direction is all about. Whatever's on you, it's temporary because God has brought about hope for you. Another verse, Romans chapter five, verse eight is a verse we've used often. And would you read this aloud with me? But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Realize that the resurrection of Jesus completes redemption. So Jesus has came, it says he died for us. Your guilt, my guilt was all placed upon him. He became your sin offering and he took your punishment and my punishment. But when he rose from the dead, he completed the whole redemption process. It's done, it's finished. All your sins completely forgiven. But it's important that we accept that gift. So Jesus paid for it. And we can say, oh, it couldn't be this sin. And that's saying Jesus didn't do enough. He did enough. You're having trouble forgiving somebody else their sins? Jesus died for them. And his grace is sufficient to cover not only all of your sin, but all of their sin. And we need God's grace in our life. The gift of salvation is there for us. It's something we must receive. Those sins in your life, even those secret sins that are off over in the corner that you hope no one else knows anything about, guess what? Jesus knows all about those. And Jesus says, I forgive those. There's those family heirlooms that, I, that are precious. And we've got some that family's been passed down from generations, those things you hang on to that are good. But there's another kind of family heirloom that's passed down generationally. That's sin nature, sin traits. 
And Jesus has conquered it. The redemption is there. And you need to claim the blood of Jesus and say, this changes in our family line. And it stops here by the power of God. And you don't pass it on to others. You ask God for forgiveness. It's there laid out in front of you. You acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. You ask him to forgive your sins. And his answer is, I know you know the answer. Let's, let's, let's try that again. You ask Jesus to forgive your sins, and his answer is? Yes. Thank you. Yes, it's strong. Chapel, I hope you got that too. Let's try it one more time. Ready? You ask Jesus to forgive your sins, and he says? Yes. It's complete. It's there. And you have this forgiveness, and then that process continues in your life, how you live in it, you walk in it. At the end of Matthew, when he's writing about Jesus, he says, you go and you make disciples. Disciples are someone who have accepted Jesus and followers. That word just means a follower of Jesus. So when someone hears the gospel message, the response is, yes, Jesus, I acknowledge who you are, and would you forgive my sins? And he says, yes. and you're a follower of Jesus. So you become a disciple, and then Jesus said this, you baptize them, and then you teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And by the way, the baptism is not a suggestion. This is from Jesus, our Messiah, you become a disciple, a follower, you baptize them, and then you learn to obey. It begins that way. You don't have to learn everything, get it all right, and you're here today saying, well, I have a lot to learn before I can do this. No, you don't. You start by accepting the gift of Jesus, and then you surrender to baptism, and then you grow and you walk with him. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says this. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. In verse five, if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. So baptism, the way the Bible lays it out, is this incredible picture of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And so for, for hundreds of years, the only way they did it was by, by immersion. And the immersion baptism, it pictures this. So here you are, the person goes and they stand in the baptistry or they stand in the river or the lake in the body of water. And they're standing there and remember that Jesus became our guilt offering. So you recognize that I am dead in my sin. I'm separated from God. And just like Jesus, after he, was, after he died on the cross, he was buried in the tomb. So the same thing. Each person is buried in the water. It says by Romans, you're buried with him. You go under the water. The Bible also says, a baptism, it says you're being clothed with Christ. So it's a picture of that water, just it's like Jesus, just wrapping around you completely, enwrapped in Jesus. It also pictures that their sins being washed away. Now, the water doesn't do that, but the baptism into Jesus, what Jesus does for you. Jesus forgives your sins. And when that person is lifted up out of the water, by this verse, it says it's a picture of the resurrection of Jesus. That Jesus is resurrected to new life. And each of us, when we accept the gift of Jesus, you're resurrected to new life. The completion of redemption is done for each one of us. As you respond to him, Sins are gone. The enemy's defeated. Now we still have that sin nature in our life, but you begin this process of walking and growing with him. And that hope is for every one of us. The hope of being with Christ and the power of prayer. The power of walking with him. I want to share a little story with you, and it's um, one that happened right here in St. Charles County, which is a great thing. The movie Breakthrough just came out. And we went and saw it this week. Some of you did as well. And if you haven't, I hope you do over the next couple of weeks. And it's an incredible story about these three young men. Um, well, John Smith is 14. His two friends, both their first names are Josh. And it was a Martin Luther King Day uh, back in 19, or 2015. And they were, went out on Lake St. Louis, were skating around on the ice. It was a warmer day. It was 40 degrees. And you know the story. They fell through the ice. And this tragic happening was there. One boy was able to get scrambled up and get back up on top of the ice. The other two were not able to. 911 was called. They got there. The a second boy was able to be rescued and pulled back up on the ice. But the third boy, John, had already submerged and went under. And the two firemen, first responders, got in the water and they used long poles, right? And they did. They finally were able to get a hold of his body and pull it up. It had been under at least 15 minutes. They got him up and they began the CPR process and which continued for the next 35 to 40 minutes as they transport him to the emergency room. And you know the scenario, what's going to happen. 
Well, one of our church members, part of our family members is Dr. Kent Suterer, and he was working that day. In fact, he's working at the ER at SSM Lake St. Louis today, and he's going to be at our six o'clock service and share with us. But he's, I asked him, and we'll, so we did a little video testimony of him. Listen to his story about what happened when young John Smith was brought into the emergency room. It was a quiet day in the emergency, emergency department before then. When we got the call from the 911 operator, they called and, and gave us a heads up that there would be multiple drowning victims coming in. My name is Kent Suter. I'm an emergency room physician at uh, SSM Lake St. Louis. I've uh, been, been there for about seven years now. The 911 operator did not spell out a, a pretty scene. Multiple drownings underneath the ice. Who was cold, he was drowned. No pulse, uh, no respirations. Multiple breathing tube down his throat. Um, this is a dead 14 year old boy. Well, we performed CPR on him continuously for 35 to 40 minutes with no success at all, no signs of life, um, no efforts of breathing, no activity from his heart. We are continuing to try and resuscitate in a futile attempt, but it, we, do, we don't always do it for the victim, we do it for the parent. It allows them closure. But in this particular instance, whenever they brought John's mom in, they brought Joyce in, um, and I, I told her, I said, your son's dead. He is not gonna come back from this. He's been, he's been gone too long. And she shouted out in prayer, come Holy Spirit and save my boy. But she said it in such a, a vocal and almost authoritative manner that people on the other side of the emergency department heard it, pleading with God, a prayer with great expectation behind it. At that moment, yeah, John's heart started again. And whenever she prayed, it was as if the Holy Spirit walked through the door and touched John. There's something that is just absolutely fearful in my, you know, in my innermost parts to think that I could have been within feet of the work of God or an angel or the Holy Spirit. I don't know how it all works, but you could feel the spirit moving through the room and it caused me to tremble. Still today, it, it, it leaves me kind of dumbstruck that I would have the privilege to be that close to the work of God. Sometimes when I hear people give the excuses of why this wasn't a miracle, we have all of these timestamps on our electronic medical record or how long this happened from the 911 call to the, you know, when we give medicines here just to see the totality of it and the what we consider perfect documentation in a in a digital world um, it's it's pretty mind-blowing but it makes it beyond the shadow of a doubt we can see that God loves us and God can resurrect people from the dead. Uh, God resurrected himself to save us from our sins. I mean, we're all fallen creatures. And God looks beyond all of our selfishness and offers us a salvation that we don't deserve. It's mind blowing. You know, we take all of this with such a laissez faire attitude. Um, when we should be out there sharing this, uh, this gift that God's offered us with everyone that we know.
story continues. As many of you know, he was uh, transported by, airlifted down to Cardinal Glennon SSM. And still the doctor, Dr. Garrett there, has an incredible story of what happened. And he said, everything still said the young man wasn't going to live, even though the heartbeat was there. Dr. Garrett describes a breakdown of all that was going on in his body and, and mentally being without oxygen for that long and all the processes that if he were to possibly survive, it would be with many, many problems. But two weeks later, young John Smith walked out of the hospital completely restored in an incredible fashion. The doctors say, and I can't lay it out, he said, Doyle, there's, I don't know if there's anything that's been documented so well, scientifically, medically, of all the improbability that this young man could live, but yet he's still dead. It is nothing to be explained except the power of God. And that's our God, that's our resurrected Jesus. And there's hope in that. Now that kind of raises a question, you go, okay, Jesus, you could do that, you did it. These doctors lay it out medically saying, without a doubt, God did that. You think, okay, God, if you did that, then why don't you do whatever, fill in the blank? And we don't understand why does God move it sometimes like this and other times he doesn't and you're wondering where it's at. And I don't understand everything about God and I had a wise guy tell me, my mentor, Ben Merrill, said years ago, Doyle, if you could understand everything about God, then how big of a God is he? He's no bigger than your brain and that's frankly not very big. <laughs> and so... I accept, God, you have all the power, the resurrect Jesus, which you've done for so many people, these miracles, but God's power resides in each one of us through the Holy Spirit as followers of Jesus. And we need to realize that, and God's power working in you, like, in your life, he gives you redemption, he's created you to serve, and that power of the Holy Spirit resides with each, each one of us. Too many times we follow Jesus on the side and the Holy Spirit's way over here somewhere and the need we call upon him realize it's a part of our life and we need to live in it every day. And the resurrection of Jesus compels us to go, compels us to make a difference, compels us to serve. It compels you to go and live in a life of prayer and confidence with God, humility, understanding the power of God's working through you and you share with what's going on. You don't keep it to yourself. There in Luke chapter 24, Jesus speaking with his followers, he says this. He told them, Jesus told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And the word is being shared and Luke writes another book. He continues right in where the gospel of Luke uh, ends off. He picks up in the book of Acts. Luke writes this, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And he says, now that you're a follower, now that you understand the resurrection, you're a witness. And you share what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've experienced. You share what God's doing in your life. He says, you begin right now where you're at. Right where you're at. Here at the church, and it begins in your home, and it begins in your school, and it begins in your work, and you're a witness of Jesus wherever you go. You're a witness that continues in telling and sharing the story, and, and then you reach across divisions. It says, go to Samaria. You go to different people who are different from you, crossing racial lines, crossing economic lines. You're crossing religious lines, and you're crossing out because the boundary of the Jesus Christ, there is none. His grace permeates all and loves all, and so we witness that, and we live that, and so we serve, and we go. Go over to a couple chapters, Acts chapter 4. We see this where the people got this. They understood it. Their lives they were motivated by the Holy Spirit, and it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. These men, these men and women were completely devoted followers of Jesus. It says, when it came in their life, they were there. It says, when they were just breaking the bread, they were sharing together. They were believing together what they had in common. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They were together. There were relationships and sharing together because of what God had done in their life. It says, selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. 
They became generous people. The power of God comes in and transforms our heart. It doesn't matter the stingiest of person who you are, how you've been hurt in the past. The generosity of Jesus Christ should flow through your heart as a follower. You become generous because you love and you serve and you reach out. It says every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. Again, this relationship of sharing and celebrating what God had done. And then selling their possessions. Oh, then they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with clients and sincere hearts and praising God. A couple times this passage, some of them sharing together. They ate meals together, but they also celebrated the Lord's Supper together like we did. We do that every weekend here because we want to be reminded when we come together. The reason why we do this is because the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, that is the core of our faith. Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, knowing that redemption is complete, that's got to remain in our heart all the time. And then they were praising God, they were worshiping God everywhere they went, and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When followers of Jesus, they live in the grace of Christ, they live in the power of the Holy Spirit, and their witnesses is called, the natural result is other people are going to be drawn to because you reflect who Jesus is, and people are drawn to him, and people come to know him as a result. And everyone in this room who's a follower of Jesus should be living in the grace and the power of the resurrection and you're being a witness and everyone around you should see Jesus reflected in your life. Jesus was a servant. He came to serve. And he tells us we are to serve. We're redeemed to go, to make a difference. Not just little Jesus over here, but it should transform your heart and your life. And you look and you see people as those in need and you reach out and you love them. And as a church, we want to be that kind of a church. Not just a group that's huddled over here in the corner, but a church that's actively engaged in our community. Next week, we're going to begin a series and just look at different ways that we can reach out to our community and serve. And how we can engage in the city and our world and in your home and make a difference for Christ. And so Bill and his team are putting together several projects, and we want you to mark aside May 18th. It's a Saturday. We're going to be doing this all month long, but particularly in that day, May 18th. And we as a church are going to impact our community way, that hopefully that they will be able to see Jesus. And so we're going to reach out to four different elementary schools and four different school districts in Francis Howe and St. Charles, Parkwood, and Hazelwood. They've invited us to come in, and we're going to do several projects to help these schools. We're going to go to two different Salvation Armies, the one here in St. Charles, the one in O'Fallon, and help with their facilities, what's going on. And we have a life group that serves meals there regularly, but we as a group want to work out. And, and make a difference there. We want to reach out to Sparrow's Nest again. It's an incredible ministry began by a, a family from this church. It's a home for unwed teen moms. We're going to go, and there's several project help with their crisis nursery here in town. Need some help. We're going to work with them. We're going to work with our kids, the families, and we're going to go to all the first responders in the area, the police and the fire departments, and give them some gifts of encouragement. Let them know they're appreciated and they're valued. We're going to go to Sharing Shed, this incredible ministry that, that gives out furniture to people who are in need and help them with some projects in front of them. We're going to go to the city parks here in St. Charles, as well as O'Fallon, and reach in and do some cleanups and projects they've asked for help for. We've got prayer teams that are going to be organized together with kids and adults as well to go and pray for all of our first responders and travel around our county and go to different schools. And we're also going to go to different churches because we do kingdom work together. We ask God to lift up their work, what they do. It's a group that's going to go out in the trails here in our property and begin cleaning and getting ready the trails, get the trails ready for Journey to Bethlehem for this fall, this, this Christmas. And we're going to be packing food to give to people in their need around the world that are hungry, and we want meals to go and to be blessing to them. And then the backpack ministry, which is done, something that's done here, Nancy Hahn leads this. Several team of the, this church come together as a team, and you prepare meals for uh, uh, around 130 kids every weekend throughout the school year that wouldn't have food for the weekend otherwise. And we want to do some things to help that ministry move ahead even further. And there's other projects that our Troy campus is going to be doing. But we want to make a difference on that day because it doesn't do any good for the grace of Christ if we just take it and we, again, to huddle here and hide it by ourselves. Because we're redeemed to go, to make a difference. Through the resurrection of Jesus, it makes a difference. It makes a difference for salvation. It makes a difference in how we respond to him. God, we're so grateful for the power of the resurrection of Jesus. We're grateful that death didn't conquer him, but yet he conquered the evil one. Father, there's those amongst us who have this incredible struggles of going on. Father, for the person today who's lost all hope, I pray that you would give 
them hope today. For the person overwhelmed with grief, Father, by your resurrection, give them hope. Father, for the person that's struggling with the weight of heartache and sin or an addiction, Father, I pray that the message that you've conquered Satan would come in and give hope and strength. Father, we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to move in this room in the lives of people today. Father, I pray that your spirit would stir our hearts and our souls, that we would live in the grace and it would transform our hearts. And that, Father, we would be your witnesses, not only by how we live, but by our words wherever we go. Empower our students, God, in their schools, that they would stand for you. Empower our members where they work and where they serve. And Father, in our homes, that we would be examples and pictures of you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.